Beep boop. Intro music. Welcome to that's <laughs> well, not what you had. That welcome to the Cypher Sci-Fi, where we explore the how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. We have another special guest co-host. It's Nick Farmer. Hey, Nick. Hi, guys. Nick Farmer is a linguist, and it's, I don't think you don't even call yourself a conlanger. Usually, you just you are a linguist, and you got kind of roped into your gig. Is that how it works? That's pretty much how it works. I mean, I I suppose that conlanging is is one of the things that I do. Um, I mean, it's certainly the reason why you're talking to me right now. But um, I mean, yeah, it it really was by coincidence, and I. I only have a loose association with uh, other conlangers. All right. All right. So for those for those not in the know, exactly. So a conlanger is it's a portmanteau, right? Well, hold on. How about? Or we have we have two things here. One, what's a conlanger? What the hell is that? Why do you have a linguist on the show? And then who the hell's Nick Farmer? Why do we care? I'll tell you, Nick Farmer. He's the dude behind the Belter Creole language on the really impressive sci-fi series, The Expanse. Yeah, that, that's. Definitely how most people know about me. But that's cool. So this episode, this is another special topic episode, which I think we've done one other time. Yes, maybe. I think so, yeah. We took an episode where we spoke about just, we ranked our top five sci-fi TV shows and talked about why we liked them and just shared our opinions for once. We never do that. Yeah, we never we never share opinions <laughs> on things. But in this case, we are going to take another another episode to do a special topic thing where we're just going to talk about language stuff, linguistics, and then language in sci-fi and fiction and basically just kind of in general. This should be interesting for me because this is – Chris Chris really wants to do this. This is this is his jam pretty much. Yeah, and I really have this guy here to, to help us. Nick has come to help us talk about language and – created languages and jargon and everything about language in sci-fi that we can come up with in the course of the recording. Mm -hmm. And hopefully a bunch of stuff about The Expanse, because if there's something you know more about than any of us, it's going to be that one. Well, Because you created it. I should hope so. Okay. (laughs) Unless you've been hacking my computer. No, not yet. yet. Hello. Uh, Well, should I talk about what a conlang is and what a conlanger does? So, I mean... Yeah, everybody, everybody's, I think, somewhat familiar nowadays. I mean, just given how popular Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings is. Um, I mean, people like that's usually how I describe it. Like, hey, you watch that show. And then, of course, immediately they ask, oh, my God, did you create Elvish? And I say, no, the guy who did that has been dead for a long time. But <laughs> So you, you could know. say yes and no one can challenge you. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, mean, there is the Internet. <laughs> yeah, as, as long as as long as, you know, nobody quotes me on that. I don't want to, I don't want to, I mean, I'm sure I would have a lot of, I mean, people get really sensitive about this stuff. Oh, no kidding. Especially Tolkien. Especially Tolkien. But um, anyway, I mean, there's been a lot of stuff that, uh, that that constructed languages have been used for. I mean, throughout history, like if you go all the way back, you know, people were using it for like religious mystical reasons. Um, and then there have been, you know, sort of attempts to, create like the perfect language like which i mean a, a more recent attempt uh is i can never is it lodge ban i think yeah lodge ban is where the, you know just like the well symbolic logic turned into mm-hmm. a language um and then you know there are people who i mean i think a lot of people are familiar with esperanto which was an attempt to foster world peace by having everybody be able to talk to each other uh which i mean makes sense until you realize that like most wars happen between people who already are perfectly capable of talking to each other (laughs) because they're next to each other. And that's why they're, yeah, exactly. Um, still a nice idea. Yeah. I mean, if if you think about it, like it's not as if like the French and Germans in medieval Europe weren't able to talk to each other. I mean, like people were bilingual, people are still, you know, bilingual in most parts of Europe. They're, they're perfectly capable of talking to each other. They just really don't like each other. (laughs) But, um, what I, 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 my goals are, are none of the above. For me, it's just, uh, it's for an aesthetic purpose of, of, um, kind of adding to the depth of a, uh, you know, a, of a imagined world. It's just, I could totally see the appeal, like the fun puzzle solving aspect. Oh, yeah. It, and that's actually like my favorite thing about it is when, um, they give me, you know, like the producers will come and they'll say, Hey, Nick, we need a word that, like, has this like specific meaning with all these like cultural 
you know, uh, connotations. And then, I mean, I have this added um, restriction compared to, say, uh, you know, Dothraki from Game of Thrones or um, Elvish, which those are both completely unrelated to any language currently spoken, and that's by design. Whereas, uh, the, you know, Belter, Creole, and the Expanse, it's, it's set in our universe, you know, our world 200 years in the future, um, and it's based off of currently existing languages. So I have to not only figure out, like, the perfect way to, you know, say something, but it also has to actually have an etymology that makes sense. I mean, it has to come from, you know, words that people already are using now, and then I can write a story that says, okay, you know, the, the, the meaning of this drifted and you, know, you had immigrants who were, you know, going to, you know, this particular asteroid meeting those immigrants and so on and so forth. And, um, it's, there's a lot more, uh, restrictions, but you know, when I get it right, it's, it's definitely satisfying. Is it, so I guess it's kind of harder and easier just depending on which aspect we're looking at. I assume that there's a ton of constraints because you're not allowed just free reign of world building. Like you were saying with Dothraki, he could just like, these events happened. And then now you have to have an actual basis (laughs) and constraints and they have to make sense. Like yeah, the, the showrunners context, could right? just make up history of this fictional world if they needed to fill the gap. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm still to a certain degree. And actually, there was a there was a meeting where I was in the writing writers' room, and I you know talked to the showrunners, and then I also talked, you know, I mean, to Ty Frank, who's one of the two authors of the books that the, uh, the show is based off of. I mean, he he and Daniel, the other author, they're both producers, they're both involved. So I got the approval from. All of these people that like to the degree that I need to make up stories in order to make the etymologies work like that is TV canon to a certain degree. So, for example, nice. the word like for singing, like the noun singing or, you know, song is a day And the idea was, OK, well, you know, in the like tw- late 22nd century, there was this retro mania for Adele and like everybody was just obsessed with her. <laughs> But that, you know, and so then like her name just became synonymous with singing. But then a hundred years later, people completely forgot about her, but the word still stuck. So, you know, it's not a, I I still get to make up little tiny details, but in general, yeah, I mean, the, the biggest constraints are, are just this has to have to use words that exist, but then also it has to be like a real Creole. And I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of Creoles that, you know, it currently exists and there's a big debate about how you define a Creole, what, you know, where they come from, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, there's definitely a lot of agreement that there's big similarities between them, which, yeah, it makes it easier because I can, I could model the language after them, but also harder because if I get anything wrong, uh, people get, you know, they're, they're more likely to notice it and they actually have a better, I mean, nobody can tell David Peterson who created Dothraki, hey, wait, you're not supposed to do that. That's not what a Dothraki person would do because, <laughs> you know, there, there's no Dothraki people out there to be offended. But there are like speakers of Haitian Creole who might get upset if like I I mean, they'd really have to go into the details, but it's theoretically possible. Yeah. And with the exposure that the show gets and the big audience and the number of people who are starting to become, it seems, interested in Conlang stuff, there's enough people watching that someone's going to tell you on Twitter. Yeah, I definitely I've, I've definitely gotten uh, some, I won't say like aggressive, tweets, <laughs> but I've gotten some like confrontational tweets where people, um, you know, try and tell me I'm wrong. But the thing is, they're usually people who uh, like don't have a background in linguistics. Um, the the people, I mean, the actual linguists that I've met either are completely uninterested, <laughs> as in like it's totally beneath them what I'm doing, or they think it's really, really cool, and they they to- they follow along. That's interesting. So I guess I guess I never I'm not part of the community as much as I'm looking at it interestedly from the outside. Mm-hmm. Does it tend not to be taken seriously by actual linguistic community? Yeah, like well, the academics. The academics definitely do not take it seriously, and the historical reason for that is that um, you remember when I was talking about these attempts to create a uh, a perfect logical language? I mean mm-hmm. that started in with the enlightenment and um, it for a long time was actually considered a very serious 
uh, endeavor that like people um, would get, you know, like funded by, you know, the kings and heads of state to try and create the perfect language. And ultimately, everybody realized this is a total crock <laughs> and funding went away. And similarly, like, you know, when Esperanto didn't stop, you know, war, people got kind of disappointed. And uh, there, there was like a lot of prestige was lost. And then also for academic linguists, they're supposedly only interested in um, how people, you know, naturally use language. And they're not as interested in, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's not data for them that they can use as opposed to like, if they're, you know, like going out into the Amazon and recording an indigenous language there, that's data that they can then use for whatever theories that they have. They can't use, um, you know, Belter for that. It's interesting because actually to think of the biggest example that anyone might be aware of who's not a total nerd like us of, of the constructed language thing is Elvish and all the other, actually not even just Elvish, but the family of languages in the mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings movies. And that guy, that J.R.L. Tolkien was a philologist, right? Right. So he was actually an academic linguist who, I guess this one, this is the one time they were really enamored with the idea because this guy totally went deep. We could talk a bit about examples of interesting language stuff in movies, TV, whatever, that are not quite fully designed languages, but offer something for conversation. You know, not fully constructed languages. I mean, probably the most famous example of that would be NADSAT in Clockwork uh, Orange. Oh, okay. I didn't know the name for it, but actually that was on my list. That's a great example because I guess that was a short-term evolution from English and Russian. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's still it's still English, just with a lot of you know borrowed words. And he, uh, I mean, he's uh, Burgess, right? Anthony Burgess was the sounds author. about right, yeah. So he um, he wasn't a linguist, but he was just a really smart guy who actually just had a really good feel for things, and he used a lot of processes uh, for word formation that people actually use. Um, oh, like the things he was doing were techniques that you, as someone constructing languages, would actually put into play. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like he, th these techniques are very. I mean, they're they're for a specific context, and which is like as you were saying, sort of. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say language change because you know slang doesn't actually contribute to language change as much as people often think it does. I mean, it was still like all English grammar um, that hadn't changed at all. It's just that you had, you know, instead of like awesome or cool, you had horror show. You know, or instead of like head, you had Gulliver, but it's not like the word order changed or, you know, you all of a sudden had like, uh, you know, new um, verb conjugations or anything like that. Right. So I got and let's we should keep in mind, like how new the idea of production is actually putting energy and money into this sort of thing is like Tolkien was a special, really special, crazy thing. At the beginning of the 20th. No one does that. Who would do that? Why would anyone make a whole family of languages? Well, it's part of the world building. I mean, yeah. a lot of authors have volumes of stuff that aren't in the book that are just the history that they can draw upon. But like you were saying, Nick, when Tolkien's making this and he had linguistic training, so he actually had the tools to try to put something like this together. There was no conline community yet in like 1939. I don't know right. where did he start writing the book. Yeah, no, there, he had this story about how he was in the trenches you know, in World War One, and uh, how he, like, overheard this other guy talk about, like, just muttering to himself about his own created language, and that's when he realized, you know what, there's actually other people who are probably doing this. He never actually spoke to the guy, and <laughs> given that it was World War One, that other guy probably died. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there, was, there definitely wasn't a community, but the thing is, like, what a lot of people don't realize is that Tolkien made the languages first, and then he made the stories... He wrote all, you know, all all those books just to provide context for the language because he thought that a language wasn't very interesting unless you had the, you know, the world to go with it. So he did it, you know, backwards of, of way, the way people are doing it now. I oh, mean, wow. he was solely interested in the language. And then, you know, he just happened to come up with these like super all time best selling books that he didn't just care about as much. He creates languages, and then he just creates an entire genre off of that. Yeah, yeah. Let's stop and appreciate for a second. I had no idea. This is blowing my mind. So this dude makes a bunch of elvish family languages, 
And he's like, man, I need to come up with stories to explain why these words happened. And that's how we get the most important thing that happened in literature in the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned. That's incredible. That's, yeah. And I mean, he started with, you know, sort of things like the Silmarillion because he wanted to explain, okay, why is it that, you know, there are these different stages of language development? Well, it's because, you know, elves went through different stages of history. Right. So that explains why the Silmarillion is pretty much an encyclopedia because it was pretty much an encyclopedia. <laughs> that's great. And that's like, you can see it because... You mentioned it was like world building and it's important and it added depth to it. And it really added a lot of depth. Even that was a special anachronistic example that was really early for what we have now. But it was language, and in this case, entirely created language, building depth into the whole thing and adding a lot of flavor and realism to what was actually just fantasy in that case. And then when we're talking about the Clockwork Orange, and as we get closer to now... It's still been a thing. Language has been an important thing to play with in fiction and in building a world. And it, the Clockwork Orange wasn't constructed, but I think that was a good one, where it was just mostly slang, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But there are other ones that seem to, to stray a little closer to actually building something more seriously. Yeah, I think the reason why language is so effective at adding depth to a world is just because it is so much a... Uh, I mean, it's it's one of the you know, fundamental identifying characteristics of, of humans is is our language, and you know, it's something that also is really tied to our identity. I mean, people people react to language very viscerally. It 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 goes somewhere deep. Well, it's common. I mean, you deal with it every day, mm -hmm. so you can really. I guess, hit that commonality between people with it. Either draw them in, like, hey, what's going on? Or And most folks would tend probably not to think about it too hard. It's just like you meant, it, it's something that you're feeling, especially in some fiction or in a TV show or in a movie where there's like really effective jargon, maybe, or the slang, just to go back to the slang for a second, like Andrew Nichol movies, what is it, In Time, Truman Show, Keep Going, Gattaca. Like these are, him in particular, he had a lot of like natural sounding very convincing, and it added really good flavor, slang, that didn't stand out as hitting you in the face with trying to make a point about the future. Even Idiocracy yeah. you mentioned, which I thought was funny because it's so dumb, <laughs> not even as a negative critique. So it, it can touch us when we're not paying attention, and when we are paying a little more attention, it can really communicate a lot about the characters in place. I'm not expert. We had a guest who was a total Dune encyclopedia. It was crazy. But mm -mm. like that one, there was a lot of Arabic worked in, where there wasn't any language development, but there was a sprinkling of something in there that added a lot of feel to the characters. They were exotic sand people instead of just a bunch of white dudes with blue eyes. Yeah, it immediately conveys a sense of history to it. Mm -hmm. That there's this depth. Yeah, like and you you're know you're getting to see like the ripples on an ocean and that there's so much more beneath it. That's good. Look at you. Right? Look at that. Look at you using <laughs> language. But in the case of Dune, it was Keep in mind, what when did they write when when did Frank Herbert write Dune? Was that the fifties, sixties? Because people in America didn't know any Arabic words back then. So, oh, jihad, jihad sounds great. Let's have jihad. Like, it was totally not the same thing as it is now. It would have added a lot more of an exotic feel, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, and, you know, a lot of it also just, it's it's because our brains are, I mean, a huge portion of our brain is devoted to language processing. Um, so, and it's, it's that that's, that's the main reason why it's going to hit you like that. People now are becoming also much more consciously sensitive to it. I mean, like you said, you know, people didn't know necessarily about, you know, the word jihad before, but I mean, beyond just that, um, there's a lot of, there's, a, you know, I mean, some people think it's great. Some people think it's awful, but you know, this idea, you know, in terms of like PC culture that like what you say is, you know, matters and how you say it matters. So people are definitely paying attention to language more than they were. Yeah. So, for example, in, in 1984, where you have, you know, this idea that uh, you're creating a language, you know, that, that is supposed to limit how people think, um, that is a strong interpretation of what's called the wharf appear hypothesis, which is that uh, the language that you speak influences how you perceive things. And everybody's heard this, like, oh, you know. Some people don't have a word for blue, so they don't see this. <laughs> they don't see the color blue, or or they have no number like, past four, or whatever. Yeah, they don't yeah. have a number past four, so they can't count. And um, I mean, you know, I can just 
confidently say that it's all, you know, BS because there's been a ton of research that's gone into that. And the extent to which they've found uh, that, that the language that you speak may influence how you perceive things is really minuscule. It's like if you speak a language that has a combined word for blue and green, uh, which, and, you know, we call grew, uh, then <laughs> if you are looking at a particular batch of like a circle of, you know, different swatches of color, on if it's in your like right field of view, meaning that it will be processed by the left side of your brain, which is where language usually is processed, you, there's about like a two or three millisecond delay before you recognize the swatch that's different from the others. So that sounds yeah, like a I mean, really useful thing you could use <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as a so government. Basically, like yeah, maybe there's the tiniest of like influences, <laughs> but it's not as severe as like. If you don't have a word for revolution, then you don't know how to have a revolution. <laughs> and it's it's one of the things that um, I mean, it, it actually goes back to the sort of classic debate. And again, you know, this idea of like prescriptivists who say, no, no, no mm -hmm. language needs to be this way. Everybody needs to speak this way because that's the pure way. That's the cultured way. This is the intelligent way. And if you speak the other way, then you're stupid or, you know, uncultured or, you know, it's going to lead you to be a violent brute. And the, I think the PC culture to a certain degree in terms of just like, don't use certain words, it doesn't always work that way because you can apply as many euphemisms as you want, but give it another 20 years and whatever euphemism you use, that's going to be a bad word now. And you can have another one, that's going to be a bad word because the fundamental issue is culture affects language, not the other way around. It's the whole contextualization. People don't really go into that. Like the idea that there are bad words, like you have curse words and those are bad. There yeah. are no such like magic words. We don't, they don't exist. It's harder to have a conversation with my four-year-old though about like, Nils, there's context. <laughs> there's, I say it all the time and he just looks at me like, what are you talking about? Daddy, I have no idea. <laughs> There's no yeah. bad words. There's well, just you know how when you times. say, you know, shut the front door? Yeah. <laughs> in context, house. it kind of means the same thing. But people are going to, they're going to provide the dirtiness. And that's actually one of the things that like was really like challenging with, you know, making up a, a constructed language is like they, um, the, the producers, you know, they wanted their, the expanse version of like frack or, you know, mm -hmm. in a, and then, then there's like two, well, there's a big debate because there's two ways that you can go about doing this. You can either do the, um, the Firefly route, which is just have everybody swear in another language. Sounds easy. You know, and for Firefly, it was Chinese. Or you can come up with a word that, you know, is like nonsense, but that sounds really similar. And, you know, there were, I tried to strike something down the middle, which was, okay, I'm not going to just take straight Chinese swearing because that's also kind of boring because also every swear word that you can think of originally came from a perfectly okay word. I mean, like the word f originally came from like, you know, a proto-Germanic word, which meant like to, to push. So what I did with the expanse is I took, uh, actually the Chinese word for to mount and then, you know, Mandarin, it literally just means to, you know, ride a bicycle or ride a horse, but yeah, give it 200 years of semantic drift. And it, so that's how I came up with Pasheng. Totally reasonable. And that's a good, like, think about what do you need in a word for it to be, you have to be able to, like, say it when you're mad and make a fist. Exactly. That's good. That's a good one. That was, that was, that was the sort of challenge. Like, I needed, okay, I needed, aesthetically needs to be, you know, yeah, that you can put a lot of, like, air behind it. Um, but also, they wanted something that would not be censored because, you know, if I just use the, you know, whatever this, you know, swear word is in Mandarin, if they tried to send the show to China, they wouldn't air because of that. So right. now I could get around it so that the thing is, though, but any Chinese speaker hearing that, if they think about it, they're like, hey, that makes sense. <laughs> they'll get it, at least. They'll, yeah. they'll get it. The, th the, the <laughs> other thing that I went with was, OK, I have to, like, imagine, let's say that it's like, you know, I don't know, like two people are in bed. But you, like it actually has to kind of work that way. But that's interesting. So you had to take the other, you also had to approach it for other uses of the word. And, and also on top of that, I guess, you have to basically consider your main audience when you're designing the Conline, the, the Belter Creole is English speaking. So yeah. it's not that the a word is necessarily harsh or necessarily desperate sounding or whatever, but you have to consider how it's going to sound mostly to American speakers. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, while we're talking about funny YouTube videos, there's another <laughs> one where it's like somebody went through and they're like, okay, you know, here are words in like five different languages, one of which is German. And so it's like, okay, you know, you have like butterfly and papillon and mariposa. And then it's like schmetterling. And like, <laughs> the idea being like, oh, German is just really harsh. But the thing is to a German person, it doesn't sound harsh. Yeah, so. if you ask a Dutch guy, he thinks it's totally cool. Yeah. I, well, I, well, I mean, Dutch, That's that one's even more messed up. Exactly. I don't know what's wrong with them. They're Dutch. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of reasons why I had really took into account the English speaking audience. One, of course, because it is the largest audience in the world. I mean, there are more people that speak English either as a first or second language than any other language. Um, you know, of course, being a Hollywood show, the main audience is North America. So English speaking, but that led then to, uh, interesting decisions. So the producers also did not want to have subtitles. Uh, there are no cases of subtitles, which makes it, they, they kind of wanted something that's impossible. Like they wanted a, a, a separate language and by definition, a separate language is not going to be mutually intelligible, but they wanted that separate language to, um, sound like foreign, but still be easily understandable to an English speaking audience with no subtitles. And I was like, it's sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, nope. not gonna happen. Um, it's all on the actors, I guess, at that point. Yeah, I mean, tons there's of some context like, clues. That, yeah, they're absolutely. Like, there's you know a scene where you know Gia, the prostitute, is is really pissed off at Miller, the cop. You know, like when they're in the hospital, um, and uh, you know, and she says like Pasheng Fong, and like you know, she does it with like a rude gesture, and like in the context, you're like, okay, she's obviously swearing at him, but. And we try and fit that in as much as possible. I mean, not just the swearing, but like other things. So, for example, <laughs> if you have in the background two guys just like standing over the water cooler, like you don't actually need to understand what they're saying because, you know, I mean, like they're not that dialogue's not important. But then the thing about Creel's that and we've moved away from this direction because it was possible, but really difficult Um the thing about Creoles though is that they all stand in relation to uh, like their parent language. So Haitian Creole has this relationship with French. And so if you are in Haiti, you will, you know, give, depending on where you are, like, let's say you take a, you know, a, a day trip from the city at, out to the country and then back. And let's say you get like pulled over and then you have to like talk to like a cop and then a judge. Like you're going to use everything from like the deepest, like full Creole to like, okay, let's say you're talking to the cop. Now you're going to use like Creole with like some French words to indicate, you know, that you're being a little bit more polite. And then you're like standing in front of the judge. And now it's going to be like French with like just a Creole accent. And then let's say you go home and you're like an upper middle class family. And so now it'll be like French with a lot of Creole words mixed in. I mean, it's a, it's a whole continuum. And I mean, you see this, even like, let's say, you know, in America with like, you know, little African American vernacular English or black English, where depending on who they're talking to, you know, somebody may like have like, you know, like a very different, like the, the grammar will be different, the words will be different. But then, you know, if they're talking to, uh, I don't know, like their, their white friend's mom, they're going <laughs> to use a very different kind of English. We all do it every day. It just doesn't really occur to us a lot. It's just like when you, have this sort of uh, diglossia of, um, you know, like two different languages, it becomes a lot more extreme and it becomes a lot more obvious and people really like use it as a way to indicate like the, the social, you know, situation. Right. And so that was something that I could use in with Belter in the show that like, okay, it's totally legitimate that sometimes people are going to be speaking Belter and sometimes they're going to be speaking English. On the other hand though, the the first season it was a little hard for people I think and we're we're backing up on it a lot and we're finding we're putting ways having ways to put it more in the background and not necessarily like major parts of the dialogue just because too many people were having too hard of a time understanding it because I mean I think they should have just gone with subtitles but I mean I don't have any problem with subtitles myself but they were the producers were afraid of them afraid I mean it works for Death Rocky I don't know. they sold that one right. I noticed there's a lot of uh, body language, a lot of gesticulation to go along with the the Creole. Was that just yeah. uh, added on after the fact to help? Well, I guess with no subtitles, right? Yeah. 
No, actually, so that that's something that that is an idea that comes from the book. Oh. Uh, the idea being that these are people who spend a lot of time, uh, I mean, you know, let's say in the early days before you necessarily had space stations um, and you were building space stations, you'd spend a lot of time, uh, you know, doing like sort of like spacewalks. I mean, you'd be out in your spacesuit, tethered, like working on the station. And so just given the way that spacesuits are, you don't necessarily see someone else's face. So facial expressions kind of go out the window and also you don't even see their head. So the way that people you move their head, that goes out the window too. So that they develop different body language. And it's it's been erroneously referred to as a sign language. It's not a sign language, uh, but it's it's body language. And so yeah, the, instead of like nodding, they'll like sort of nod their fist or you know, they have like a different way of, you know, um indicating pleasure, displeasure, whatever, all those sorts of things, which actually uh, unsurprisingly, they hired an Italian choreographer to come up with the gestures. There you go. So just that's what happens with space is after a couple hundred years, you turn Italian. Basically, yeah. But it's it's more, it's again, one of those things that like it's a cultural thing. It's not a language thing um, in the same way that like if you give someone like, you, you know, flip them the bird or give them a thumbs up or a high five, like, yeah, these things have like a certain meaning, but it's not a linguistic meaning. It's not the same thing as like American sign language, which I mean, every individual gesture has a linguistic meaning, which, um, you know, is then actually processed by the brain differently. And there's, there was an interesting study where they took people who had a uh, brain damage to, you know, certain part, you know, uh, certain areas of their brain where, which deal with language processing and they were people, they were native sign language speakers and they still had no problem understanding you know, non-linguistic gestures. So if someone was like, you know, kind of like beckoning, like here, come oh. here, they would understand that they could totally, like, so it would, they hadn't done wrong with that. But if someone signed come here, they, they couldn't necessarily, they would have trouble understanding it. That makes perfect sense. Now that you mentioned it, I never thought of that before, but that's fascinating. Like your, your brain is still doing that work in the same place. Yeah. And I mean, you know, brain plasticity being the way it is, it, the good news is that even people who have strokes and lose a lot of their language ability very often get reasonable amounts of it back by having other parts of the brain do more of the processing that the, you know, handling the parts, things that the original parts would have. And so you have, you have the, a lot of gesture built into the expanse world, just out of necessity because no subtitles one and two, because it actually makes really good sense in world, which I appreciate. Yeah, I mean, and actually, the it, it came even before the necessity. It was something that they really wanted to do. And, like, it was also just a, they wanted it to be a part of the zero-G aesthetic, which I don't think any other show, I mean, there have been movies, but I don't think any other show has taken so much effort to really deal with, uh, you know, what it what it's like to, you know, spend so much time in zero-G. They didn't get to go the full you know the whole nine yards like in the books they talk about how all the belters are really tall because you know they've they've elongated with you know not nothing pulling them down uh there just aren't that many like seven foot tall <laughs> day actors out there how many seven foot tall albinos did they have that they can have as extras right yeah i mean it's, it's they, they took a couple to kind of give you the idea and then they're like okay now suspension of disbelief yeah no they do a really good job considering and I haven't read the books yet, so I didn't know what I was missing. Yeah, they, they do real good work. And now with the the gestural stuff that we're not counting as language, but it makes you think. And someone probably has already worked on this in Conlang or even somewhere, but someone could even create a language that was, you used the word earlier, multi-channel? Or multimodal. Multimodal, like yeah, like a combination of where where gestural stuff actually was was semantically meaningful and like belonged in the grammar in the sense of actually communicating meaning that hasn't happened in real life. I don't think, but could someone build that? Yeah. The thing is like, and there are, there's a whole group of conlangers who do just this sort of thing. Just like crazy they, out there versions. Yeah. They really go into like these, like, you know, weird hypotheticals of like, Hey, what if there was this alien race that, you know, yeah, did something like that. Or, you know, like if they, they didn't have, uh, you know, anything for producing sound, but they had like, 
you know, a ton of tentacles, like what kind of, what would their sound language look like? Or like, what if you had like hyper intelligent chipmunks and, you know, <laughs> that they would squeak and then, then depending on how they squeaked and like the, you know, let's say like the, the tone and the whatever, like, could you come up with enough like characteristics? So this guy actually, I think he like did some studying of like, okay, what sounds can these animals produce? <laughs> Like how many, like how many sort of phonemes could we, could we get out of this? And then, okay. There, and then, you know, they, he decided, okay, yeah, they can produce enough sounds that there's enough different phonemes that you could make a language. And then he, you know, made a language based off of that. That's awesome. I love that people do this stuff. Thanks internet. <laughs> Cause basically <laughs> that's what you need, right? The communities need to be able to develop to a point where you can have people on the fringes of a fringe thing on the fringe of the fringe of the fringe making chipmunk language. And yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's sort of like the complete, like opposite extreme of like, well, yeah, of where I am. I mean, cause I'm focused like very much on the, the, you know, constraint of it's, it's gotta be plausible in our world. So no space chipmunks. That's what you're trying no to say. No space chipmunks. Not for now. There was one thing that like I had thought of, uh, doing, but again, it's one of those things of like, you know, the, um, the producers, uh, are are very much interested in in doing um, you know doing creative things, but they also like there's a budget for everything, and also it has to sound good. One of the things that I would wanted to look into was okay, you know we've talked about how people would change living in zero g their entire lives and taking all of these drugs that you know account for like that allow them to do that. Uh, how would that actually um, affect their articulators, like all the, you know, like your, your throat and your lips and your tongue and all that. Um, mm -hmm. cause yeah, it's, maybe the tongue lengthens or whatever, make yeah, up anything. Who knows? I mean, like it's not unreasonable to or like, you know, if they, if they elongate, how does that, how does that affect stuff? Like, you know, what, what goes, what happens to their vocal cords? Right. Yeah. Um, do they all end up sounding like, have like really deep voices or really nasally voice. I mean, I don't, I don't actually know because I didn't take the time to do this, but it was something that I kind of wanted to do. But then I realized like this would actually be like years of research. And then you'd have to spend a lot of time like coming up with software that could modulate everything to fit this. And yeah, no I, kidding. It, as long as you don't sound like Batman. Sounds expensive, man. <laughs> yeah. And that's the other <laughs> thing is like you could end up like doing all this and then it would sound, it could sound terrible. <laughs> um, I mean, like two examples. One was they had thought of, hey, wouldn't it be kind of cool like to, you know, have the sound of what does it actually sound like if you're, you know, doing like a spacewalk in your spacesuit? And they actually like, you know, did rec like recordings of all these things. And they got the sound of what those footsteps would sound like. And when they listened to it, they're like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> if we put this in the audio, like it will sound terrible. Let's just come up with like, normal like clanking metal you know mm -hmm. footsteps and then the other thing is i watched a, a thing where they analyzed like neanderthals and they were like okay what would neanderthals sound like and they sound ridiculous i mean they sound like nasally shrieky like awful people and <laughs> you just can't assume that just because you've done this crazy project to make things like really a hundred percent like accurate to the hypothetical situation that it's gonna you know come off because ultimately it is a tv show it's for entertainment yeah ultimately it has to serve a narrative because that's the point of the whole thing and that's why anyone's even paying attention yeah and it's one of those things where like a lot of the time i like i mean i i kind of go backwards where i'm like you know what i really like this word or i really like this sound now let me just figure out how the hell to like to explain that away as opposed to generating it from like a you know, set of circumstances mm -hmm. and also partly uh, i was constrained because in the books there's a certain amount of language and like i was allowed to drop most of it because the author said to me hey you know what we're not linguists we literally just like made this stuff up um and not like in a not in a way that i made it up but like they they just barfed on a page and were like here you go um <laughs> don't don't worry about it. But I, the fans of the books got caught up with a couple words, um, which then I had to incorporate into the language. And then that was challenging. The, the hardest one was Beratna. Like, how do you explain the changes that led to, like, brother becoming Beratna? And 
I don't even remember. I wrote it down somewhere, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. It was a little convoluted, though. <laughs> it was a little convoluted, and it was like the one sort of set of like changes that happened in the phonology that like are stretching it. Everything else like is just fairly straightforward, but that one was like, eh, well, you know, weirder things have happened, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, although in real life, like I said, weirder things have happened. We have plenty of crazy, almost inexplicable, if we didn't have the explanation, things like that in real life, and it happens. And but yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's the idea that like the sound the could turn into like atna is it's it's a stretch but it's not as strange as like i mean in finnish you know going back to finnish there are times when like the sound cut turns into v that's a really big switch got me man but that's a real life one that's almost that's doesn't make sense one, yeah it's it's a it's a much bigger jump so the the con lining the constructed language stuff as much as it was a crazy weird fringe activity it's actually kind of cool, and it's on a big stage now because with TV and film, I think, me even in books, like Tolkien had the Elvish stuff in the books, but the books are a hard place to sell a constructed language like this because you have to put everything in a foreign tongue and then show somehow what that meant. As opposed to on TV and movies, it seems like you can just have the language, and in most cases, say Game of Thrones, just have subtitles. So there's a place for it to actually shine and be at the forefront. Yeah, it's and the thing is, like, it's also why... I mean, if you look at like a lot of um, a lot of like f- sci-fi fantasy stuff, people don't put in very much thought into the languages that show up there because they know that like there's a big preoccupation with just how things are written. So they'll just like, you know, put all sorts of crazy accents on stuff or like put in like apostrophes in the middle of a word like what's this apostrophe for does it like actually indicate anything <laughs> is that a stop or, or is it just art no i mean who knows but yeah and i it's it's something that it really does lend itself towards tv because of the fact that like the effects are a lot more i mean the effects that we were talking about at the very beginning about how you know it, people respond to language that comes across a lot more when people hear it than when they just look at it take klingon i guess right about Klingon, though, that's one where um, it was kind of an interesting take. Uh, so, and I forget the name of the guy who came up with it, which is a shame because I, I can never remember it. But he decided early on that he was going to um, take into account so linguistic, you know, universals. It's not like there's rules like, OK, if you have X, then the language also must have Y. It's more like preferences, like. And there are exceptions, but you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a preference. Anyway, what he did with Klingon is he said, okay, anytime that the preference, like if you have X, then you have Y, anytime that you have that, I'm going to go the opposite. So if I have (laughs) X, then I don't have Y. And if I'm going to, I'm going to try and come up with like, what are, so he, like the word order, for example, he picked the word order that is like the least common in the world's languages. Um, and then, you know, like all the sounds, he tried to combine sounds that like don't usually go together um, and just do all of that so that it's a plausible language, but it is as implausible a plausible language you can get. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. I didn't really understand the details of it because Klingon, because I, <laughs> I don't speak Klingon, basically. Yeah. I guess That's- you're shooting for something alien exactly for something yeah. as uncommon as possible well in supporting the narrative when you construct a language at, at the very least that seemed to communicate alienness pretty effectively oh yeah um, <laughs> and i think it's a lot more sophisticated than like a lot of the times and i mean okay this is this is tolkien's fault but you know <laughs> we, we can forgive him but it's sort of like any time that you have like you know the 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 bad guys the barbarians or whatever it's like they're all gonna say huh like <laughs> like in everything because oh give me something harsh and evil sounding and exactly. when you're an american audience or an english-speaking audience i guess that's what you wind up with right exactly or like you know if it's gonna be written down it's always gonna have a lot of like k's and x's and z's and stuff like that maybe some maybe some apostrophes stuck in the middle exactly for weirdo stop noises but um, if you then have, like, the language of, like, the good guys, like, it's going to have all these, like, liquids. So there's going to be, like, a lot of, like, L's and, th- like, a lot of thuhs and thuhs and things like that. He basically put this all down first. Because, yeah, think about, like, the Na'vi. It's got a kind of elvish, floaty, watery sort of yeah, it vibe. It rolls off the tongue right. versus from Avatar stops. Yeah, so you're right. going to have, like, a lot of, like, 
open syllables and uh, you know like the bad guys are going to have like a lot of like consonant clusters right so like the vampires in blade or the 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 bad elf people in the dark world for thor were consonant cluster lots of <laughs> noise right and also very dark skinned and evil looking oddly enough yeah because everybody elves. knows that you know if you want to make somebody look evil you gotta <laughs> you gotta darken them up yeah but yeah, yeah. well it's <laughs> you i guess maybe does does tolkien get a pass because for setting all this in motion it wasn't actually that part wasn't his idea but for but, the time yeah, I, I think he totally gets a pass because he you know i mean well first of all it's like he was the first one to do it i mean it's like he gets a pass for having orcs and elves because like orcs and elves weren't that big of a deal like when he did it it's it's not his fault that everybody copied him yeah i mean the baggage maybe didn't develop until it kept going for decades yeah and you know the other thing is it's like ultimately you know there, there's not too much that you can do with it anyway because again coming from an english perspective an english being perspective like there are just going to be some sounds that sound foreign and there's going to be other sounds that sound like aesthetically pleasing and like you know, I mean, to us, like, tones always sound kind of weird. But to someone who speaks tones, like, or who speaks a tonal language, we sound weird. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I lived in China for a bit. And, like, I just asked somebody, I was like, so what, is, what does English sound like to you? And he said, it sounds like barking dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the normal American ear palate, I just made up that term, probably isn't going to be digesting Russian and Mandarin so easily as uh, the more fluid more uh, just closer and more pleasant to our ears with air quotes. Right. Yeah. When with the belter from the expanse, when you were designing that, did you have instruction on make it sound, you know, jolly, harsh, happy, scary? Like, what, did you have? Did what kind of emotion or tone are you trying to deliver when you're coming up with the noises in there? Yeah. So, um, the the instruction that I was given for the aesthetic that they were going for was <laughs> like. Nothing that can possibly be, you know, captured um, in terms of just how something sounds. It was like, we want a language that sounds like, you know, it belongs to the sort of international working class, uh, you know, like the, the people who've been, you know, like taken advantage of and so on and so forth. And I'm like, I, I, what is what is that? I mean, <laughs> what is that? More impossibilities. <laughs> yeah. I can just imagine you in a meeting like, yeah, this is going to be great. I'll take this job. And then the first thing they tell you, you're like, I, I, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. You know, when, I heard, when I heard that, like, I was like, OK, um, you know, I know what you guys are going for. And like, I can definitely like take those sorts of elements in terms of, you know, like the etymology like the history of the words and stuff like that you're not going to get something that sounds like that uh, what i'm going to give you is basically <laughs> um you know like if english underwent creolization because because that's you know, what you're asking for that's what you're asking <laughs> for and you know ultimately they liked it um so it worked out just fine i mean and like there's certain things so for example like the number of vowels i mean english has a lot of different vowels and that went down um, so I don't know, depending on your dialect of English, people have anywhere from like 16 to 22. Um, and I think English is a very vowel language, right? As it's opposed to very language, consonant heavy. Yeah. I mean, most of the Germanic languages are, uh, English is, is not the most vowel I mean, I think Swedish or one, I mean, one of the Nordic ones has the most, but we're pretty far up there. So I dropped it down to six, like five of the most basic ones and then one that was like a little less common but just you know it, it wasn't so out of it and it, it sounded cool and that's like the all sound that made it also easier for the actors because um they didn't have to learn anything like that was incredibly difficult to pronounce i mean one of the reasons why i mean in creoles i mean the purposes that that creoles serve is is you know, they, they appear in situations where there's a lot of language contact. And so you end up with um, sort of the, the sounds that are most common in the world's languages. But it's pretty rare to get like, as we were talking about earlier, like a r sound. Or a Bantu or, click noise. Yeah. Or a click noise or like an adjective like a. Uh. Mm -hmm. That just that's pretty rare. Yeah, there um, might have been so, some people in the Belter community at one point that had that, but it might not have been the noise, the sound that was communicated that everyone else was able to reproduce. Right, exactly. Because like you know, if they say, "Oh yeah, the word for that is like 
Cool you. Everybody's gonna be like, oh, cool you, cool. <laughs> Got it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, you know, it's 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 again backed up by research. Like, and what's interesting is like certain characteristics like never show up in Creoles, like tones. So even if you have a language where the two like sort of languages that come into contact both have tones the Creole ends up not having tones. Really? That's crazy. Yeah, there's an example of this in Africa. Huh. I don't even know what to say about that. That's nuts. Yeah. Just tones are, are are really sort of less common in the world's languages. So this was a Creole. Here's my understanding. Tell me where I'm wrong, because I'm sure I'm wrong again. I was like, it was a philologist, and then I was wrong about that, and now I'll be wrong again. But basically, like in, in Blade Runner, they had city speak that they... It wasn't probably very well designed, but there was like a mishmash of different words from different languages used within, I think, just within like a, a grammar of probably English. And that isn't that basically when you're looking at a pigeon on the way to a Creole, isn't that kind of what's happening where there's uh, the words being used from different languages, not necessarily in their native construction on its way to finding its own grammar? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of debate about. Uh, oh, this is like controversial. Yeah, it's slightly controversial. Um, and of course, like with anything in academia, there's always controversy. But with Creoles, there's like the added layer of, um, I mean, the history surrounding it all is like one of like colonialism and racism. And like for a long time, like people were like, oh, Creoles, they're just, you know, like inferior languages spoken by like inferior races. And yeah. so it's it's hard to have like a, a, a straight up, conversation because people are still like getting over that um uh, but i'm gonna go with like i'm gonna basically put forward the theory that i think it probably has like the the best chance of um i mean there, there's a lot of evidence behind it and uh it makes the most sense to me and that's that um as opposed to this classic idea of okay languages come into contact then people don't have a language in common so they develop a pigeon to talk to each other. Okay, so, so far, like, that's okay. Like, yes, there are examples of pigeons in the world. Um, I was just talking with my friend last night about uh, this thing called Rusinorsk, which was in the 18th and 19th century where you had, like, Arctic merchants, like, from, you know, Russia and Norway that were, like, trading with each other. And they didn't, not, they didn't have a language in common, and so they came up with this pigeon which, um, you know, it was very, very limited. Uh, but, you know, it was like a mishmash of Norwegian and Russian words. That doesn't actually ever lead to a Creole. Like, oh. there's that the idea that like pigeons become Creoles is, um, there's not really any evidence for that. Um, okay. The mis, the, the misguided idea I had was that like their children grow up with those, with that lexicon. And like impose grammar upon it or something, but that's not how it actually seems to be. That's so a lot of people have, have argued that. So it's not like you made this up and, um, it, but the thing is that there's actually like, there isn't any, um, there's no documentation of that ever actually happening. Okay. Uh, so then uh, you have what you think is a better one. So yeah, basically that, I mean, instead of this like exceptional case, where creoles emerge from like pigeons like that they emerge from the breakdown of languages it's that creoles are essentially the result of normal language change processes but uh that because the language contact is so extreme the changes happen in a much more extreme manner you can easily plot a path from french to haitian creole and you can see how, okay, well, you know, the, the, the contact of like Igbo and other African languages would, you know, pull it in particular directions. And this is sort of, you know, the, like where, you know, linguistics, you know, has its, the, the scientific bent, which is that if you have two theories, the one which has, um, well, the evidence and, uh, the, the sort of like the less exceptional explanation is, is the one that I, I feel more comfortable going with. So it's sort of a strange assumption to believe that the kids are going to, um, you know, and it, it kind of goes back yeah, to the race thing. Yeah, classism and racism. Right. How about so, them aliens? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's, an, there's a show called The Expanse and some sci-fi that we barely talked about, and linguistics is really interesting. 
that's the end of the show almost. <laughs> Let, Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's wrap around. So right now, at this point, we would usually recommend some stuff that's related to the stuff we talked about. We have a very interesting guest on, and so I'd like to give him the chance to simply just tell us where to go to know more about him and his stuff and his work. Well, uh, I mean, I have a website, nickfarmerlinguist.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, and Farmer Linguist. Yeah, you've been you you've used your Twitter account to post different stuff about the language as it's gone on, right? Yeah, I mean, I for a while um, I was doing like a, a word of the day. I mean, I'm, I'm I try and you know respond to people's questions when they have them about the expanse and whatnot. I'm limited in what I can respond with because oh, uh, IP. Yeah, the um, IP is owned. Well, it's complicated. And th- oh, this was a topic that we never even got to the the IP, um, the status of languages and IP because that's it still has not been legally uh, addressed there oh was a really lawsuit um i'm forgetting the name of the movie but you know the fanfic movie about like star trek where then they got sued by paramount yeah whatever they were called i forget but yeah. what, what happened and it, it, it was settled out of court so there was no ruling and so we still don't know whether klingon is considered the intellectual property oh, of paramount I forgot. It's that's how they wound up suing right was over the language part one of the major parts of it that's actually the part that I saw in the article because that's the interesting part to talk about, I guess. Yes, that's yeah. definitely one of the most interesting because it, it's, it's definitely up in the air. I, so it still has not been answered. I don't want to be the one to be in a lawsuit to answer it. Um, <laughs> Let's not. Lose. So, yeah, there's there's things that I can't tell you, but there's things. And also, it's just there's things that I can't tell you because it has to do with, you know, season two. We're making season two right now. Mm-hmm. But um, feel free to reach out. I, I will answer questions and I also post stuff about linguistics all the time. Okay, right on. And I'm sure you'll be really busy talking on there about the show and whatnot when it comes back next year, right? Absolutely. Yep. January. That leads me into another thing that I would definitely like to recommend. The Expanse. Seems the obvious choice. Yes, you should watch it. We had an episode that we dedicated to awesome sci-fi television shows, but I don't think The Expanse was on yet, so I'm glad to have this opportunity. Nick Farmer, the guy in the show here, made this awesome language for this TV show, The Expanse, about people in space in the future, and it has... The reason I really dug it was it has really, really, really great world building. Like there's a really thorough, tactile, awesome world that feels lived in and well-developed. And a big part of that was the language. I remember the moment my wife and I were watching that. And these people were speaking with the, the belter and we're like, wait, what the hell language is that? Like it clicked for both of us. Like we don't recognize any of the things that are happening. It doesn't make sense. It was because someone made it up. And that's how I wound up finding out about you is when I went and looked that up. Well, you know what's amazing is um, somebody else interviewed me and was like, holy cow. I caught the word like imbobo there and that is like a Zulu word that means whole and like you made it to me in apartment like that's so great and I'm like I can't believe that you actually like got that from watching he's like yeah my wife's from South Africa it's like damn see but yeah he really he, he figured that out I was I was so happy thanks internet even for something so niche there's enough of an audience to make it like really I hope really worth it for you I hope you oh, get paid yeah. too yeah it's 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 I uh, people are sort of flocking to this stuff yeah, you're I you're hitting it at a good spot, I think, as it's like swinging up into consciousness and popularity. Yeah. Good for you and good for us because it's really fun. The Expanse. All right. Yeah, apart from the language, just really great design in general. Language design, environment design, character and costume. And detail. Everything. Fabulous. Just love it. And so highly recommended. One more thing. Oh, I'd like to recommend a book. Have you read The Art of Language Invention? Yeah, me and me and David Peterson just gave a talk at the Barry Book Festival together. Oh, neat. Two weeks ago. It was I think it was a nice talk because we could really come at things from different perspectives because I mean the languages that he's most known for and that he's, you know, um I think developed the most fully are you know, like like Dothraki, where they're, you know, as he refers to a priori languages, so they're languages that don't have anything to do with languages that are spoken. And then I could talk about the a, posterior, a posteriori ones, which are the ones that, you know, like Belter come from, you know, languages that are spoken. So we could tackle the issue from both sides. It was a good talk. And Is that it, published it, anywhere? So it was filmed, um, but it, like I said, it was only it, it was only like a week and a half ago. Like oh, right. Okay. So, you know, I can definitely send it to you guys. It'll also, when it, it'll, when it comes up, I will post it on my Twitter. Okay. I'll definitely keep an eye out. I want to certainly see that and share it around. 
But yep. okay, so this guy that we're talking about, who's this guy? He wrote a book. He's another conlanger. He's actually where you haven't been involved in the community. He's been doing it for decades, like on the email lists back in the day before we were all, yeah. before the community was large enough to be otherwise. And so he's the guy responsible for, apart from other stuff, probably a number of them, the biggest one that everyone would know is Dothraki on Game of Thrones. Yeah. He wrote a book called The Art of Language Invention, which was a little over my head, and I need to read it again to have any idea what's going on. It was an introduction to basically how to consider creating a language from scratch and all the th- all the chapters and all the different aspects of language that you need to work out. And apart from the bit in the beginning, which was a bunch of history and context, and it was all it was really fascinating and highly recommended for anyone that is interested in this creative aspect of language. I really dug it. Yeah, I mean, when people ask me all the time, like, oh, how did you make up a language. I mean, now I can just say, well, go read that book, you know. <laughs> I could tell you, but it would take 900 pages. You should probably exactly. read this book. <laughs> oh, I got to mention, Adrian Falcone, thank you, guest of the show twice? Yes. Yes, twice, was the person who recommended that book. So I hope he hears this and yeah. knows how much I appreciate that he can, actually, he bought it for me. Thank you, Adrian. I forgot that part. He's a fabulous person. And uh, that was a good book. And that's that. Show notes, that's where to get all those things. Colbert? Chris? What? Colbert, I have a list of people. Not to kill, hopefully. No. Not a list for killing. It's a list of fabulous people who support the show. They are Nick, Brian, Kathy, Andrew Capitulo, Joe Ferraro, LSG Media, LibertyStreetGeek.net, Daniel Barker of Uncertainty Principle Podcast, Adrian Falcone of co-hosting the show a bunch of times, and then Grandma Judy, numero uno. I'd like to thank all those people, though. They're really, really fabulous folks. And they warm the cockles of my heart every month when they give us some money on the internet. It's cold, cold heart. I think it's warm. You're a kill list. They warm my cockles. These people are doing a good thing. Not just for us, but like in general. Everyone out there on the internet, I think would be great if you would consider supporting the creators of the stuff you like. It's a podcast, a show on YouTube, or books, or art, or whatever. Anything that you're really into. There's someone out there making a bunch of stuff every week or every month or on some basis where they keep doing it and... It's hard, as much as this is an art, probably, especially not with a capital A. If we were the thing that you like and would like to support, we'd really appreciate it. But please, in general, support your creators. If we are the ones you want to support, decipherscifi.com slash support the show is the place to do that. You can also support us by subscribing or recommending to your friends to subscribe yeah. or even to listen in the first place, because then they will subscribe. Decipherscifi.com slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. That's the place. All right. And thanks, Nick, so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. This was, I I hope everyone else out there digs it as much. This was me indulging myself and having an episode about linguistics and language. It's been very interesting. On my side, my wheelhouse. Yeah. So I hope Colbert gets it. I hope, I hope Colbert digs it. And I hope everybody out there digs it too. Reminder, check out Nick Farmer and former linguist. Yeah. And former linguist. And former linguist on Twitter. And thank you so much for coming on. I don't know. What do we say? Usually we have a line from the movie, but we didn't talk about a movie. Oh, you know what? We should get off on uh, some Belter words. Okay, so I, well, I guess I, I do have one phrase that, that I can remember. It's really simple, um, but it's du feri de belta. It means free the belt. Du feri de belta. Du feri de belta. Yeah. That's me using a Norwegian accent because that's the only <laughs> thing my mouth can switch into that is in English. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. We could spend another episode talking about why your brain made you do that. (laughs) We should do that one day. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks so much, Nick. It's been great. Yep. Good talking to you guys. No, let me show you. (laughs) It's a great, like, it doesn't have the punch of anger, but it has the desperate life is terrible and everything is pain. You know, the other use of it? It's so fabulous. I love it. It's my favorite thing. Yeah, you can imagine a guy... Shouting that he's falling off. Why he's falling off a roof into a bush? Yeah, it's the perfect use.
He really just wants excuses to say that. I love it, man. That was, that's my favorite video on the internet lately.